Uh, aloha mai kako. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for braving the rain and this beautiful weather. I appreciate everybody who, who came out. Um, yeah, as Alana said, my name is Marcel Honore. Um, I'm a reporter. I cover, I generally cover transportation and infrastructure issues for Civil Beat. Um, I've been reporting in Honolulu for going on seven years now. Um, and I've, I have generally focused on rail um, and transportation. Uh, but I'd like to get our, our panel out here just to kind of keep things going along. Um, so we're covering transportation, or, I'm sorry, pedestrian safety and uh, generally just kind of how to, how to make our, our city here more pedestrian friendly, kind of those big ideas. Uh, so with us today, uh, first is Renee Espio. <laughs> Renee, yeah, sure, go for it. Uh, Renee is the Complete Streets Administrator with the City and County of Honolulu. She's also a co-author of the book, quote, Great Corridors, Great Communities. <laughs> um, also with us is Anthony Chang. So Anthony is an Oahu native. He's uh, an advocate for safer streets, and he's also a master's student at the University of Hawaii's Department of Urban and Regional Planning with a focus on transportation safety. His family has also seen and suffered firsthand the impacts of this issue we're talking about today, and I will, I'll leave it to him to, to share more of his story. Also with us is Kathleen Katie Rooney. Our returning champion. <laughs> uh, Katie is the transportation manager for Honolulu-based Ulupono Initiative with a background in transportation planning and design. Uh, she's worked in Florida, Washington, D.C., New York, other places, yeah? About 40 states, yeah. About 40 states, so we're in good hands there. Maybe 30. Okay. And finally, Daniel Alexander. Uh, Daniel is the co-director of the Hawaii Bicycling League and a graduate of UH's Urban Planning Department. He also co-founded Cycle Manoa and he spent years working on bicycle advocacy and transportation planning. So thanks again, you guys. So just to start things off, we'll let uh, you guys kind of go uh, in a line, however you want to take it, and uh, just spend a few minutes just individually talking about kind of what, what drives you in terms of transportation planning and pedestrian safety. Okay, I guess I'm up first. Um, okay, so I am a somewhat recently appointed Complete Streets Administrator for City and County of Honolulu. Um, but I have been working on complete streets at city and county since I think 2011 <laughs> before the uh, bill was even before our complete streets law was even adopted um, So we do have a complete streets law at city and county and it requires that Anytime we touch a street we have to be considering other users, right? So anytime we're repaving um, You know doing utility work um, all the way to big projects Every single time we touch the street, we have to consider it, which is tricky because we did a big reorg, I don't know, 1998, so I guess 21 years ago now. Um, and there are four different departments that have a different piece of our streets, which I'm sure you guys see uh, sort of uh, symptoms of as you walk around. It's like, okay, who thought about this? And usually it's because the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. Um, so my job is basically to coordinate among these four departments, our facilities maintenance guys, design and construction with do the big projects, transportation services, which does all our traffic signals, kind of smaller projects, runs the bus, um, and soon to be running rail, um, and then our planning and permitting department, with, which deal with uh, private changes to our city streets, which are surprisingly a lot of changes that you see. Um, our focus is primarily, or my focus is primarily on the engineering side, you know, right? so how we can design our streets to um, get better behaviors out of everybody, make them safer, um, and we have a lot of different projects. We look at um, building you know, bicycle lanes, building bus lanes is something we're starting to get into now. 
um, obviously creating uh, sidewalks and walking paths in places that they don't exist, which of course there's a lot of history about that. I can share more on that more. Um, but I think the crossings is probably a big reason um, that we're all here today. And I think uh, a lot of the reason why we have pedestrian safety problem is we have a hard time now getting people across these large streets that we've created over so many decades of uh, auto-oriented policies. Um, and so we're, we're start, we have a program, we're working away at it, we're chipping away at it. As we've discussed earlier though, we have 3,500 miles of county roads on this island. So it's gonna take us a very long time to go back and retrofit all of them. Uh, but we're actively working on it, we're staffing up, we're um, doing some large projects, small projects, kind of of all different scales. Um, so that's kind of the main thing we're bringing. We also, I think some of you, uh, may have noticed we have a very controversial issue going on right now. Uh, we are reassessing all of the crosswalks in Honolulu. There are crosswalks disappearing, <laughs> uh, showing up in different places. Um, of course, that's probably something we should talk about tonight. It's controversial internally as well as outside, and I think there's a lot of very gray area uh, in this discussion. It's really not black and white, um, but we um, are doing it in the name of safety, but of course, there's always more that we can do. I was actually just trying to hit up Katie for <laughs> some money to uh, see how we can build a better crosswalk. Um, so we're, 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 that's kind of the focus that we have right now is kind of more on the, on the street side, the engineering side. And then we're, of course, appreciative of our partners um, helping with some of the advocacy. Um, and we do have some education efforts internally. We have pedestrian safety in the schools. Uh, we have a Safe Droughts to School uh, program, but they're relatively small. Um, so we you know, definitely look for our partners to help with some of the other uh, elements of making our streets safer. Okay. Thanks. <coughs> okay, um, good evening. My name is Anthony. Um, as Marcel mentioned, I've been doing safe, street safe streets advocacy for about two years now. Um, this is going to respond to about, so about six years ago, my sister, Emilia Hong, at age 24, uh, was struck, after, um, died after she was struck by a car. Um, but even prior to that, um, four, years, four, um, year, four years before that, my grandma was actually struck by a car at age 80. And she only survived because she landed on the grass, but she never walked the same. Uh, both were in crosswalks, um, and as mentioned, like nobody in my family has actually ever learned to drive because it was just out of our income level. Um, While well, it's a motion that like brings me um, to this field, um, all my conclusions and analysis usually come from data, statistics, literature I've read. Um, you know, besides testifying, I, I've, I've um, written a few op-eds, um, things like that. Um, a lot of attention is focused on improving pedestrian safety, but I'm going to show you some, some facts. In Hawaii, private automobiles are involved with 99.6% of traffic fatalities involving two or more parties while accounting for about 81% of daily trips, and that's like in the last 10 years. Private, private automobiles traveling the same distance have 10 times more collisions than public transportation, including city buses, which share the same roads. Um, and I tried to find the last time like a city bus collided into another city bus, but I couldn't. <laughs> cars collided with each cars collided with each other all the time. You know, uh, last time a bus killed a cyclist was in 2006, and uh, it's only city buses have really only been involved with a handful of, of the over 1,300 deaths in the last 10 years. So yeah, my family's been <laughs> disproportionately affected by private automobile use, despite the fact that no one in my my house really rarely ever uses them. We catch rides from people on occasion, but 99. 9% of the time, you probably either walk or catch the bus. Yeah. Thanks, Anthony. Hi, uh, how's everybody doing? Good? All right. Yeah, my feet are squishing. So I'm, I'm with, right there with you because I walked here. Um, so I'm with the Ulupono Initiative, and we are a Hawaii-focused impact investment firm, and we do a lot of work in waste, water, food, and energy. And not everybody sees the transportation connection immediately, but um, sort of within that environmental space, we've been doing really good with renewables and energy efficiency, but not so hot on the energy components of transportation. And I'm gonna throw this out there. What is the most environmentally friendly mode of transportation? Thank you. So that's why we care about pedestrian safety from our organization is that it is the num easiest, it's, you could do it tomorrow, you can do it every day. Um, and so I've been sort of hired to guide our nonprofit and for-profit investments in transportation. And so we are taking on a greater interest in a lot of these other types of issues. So I think that's about it. That's Does that work? All right, that works. excellent. That's what I like to hear. All right. Thanks. Oh, you want that too? <laughs> yeah, it's useful. 
Um, so, and everyone just to think about children for a second, it's an it's a interesting window into thinking about safety. So uh, walking or bicycling to school uh, can greatly improve a child's health, uh, decrease their chances of getting uh, early onset type 2 diabetes, keep them in great health. Uh, it can improve their performance in schools. It can improve their concentration when they're in the class. So now, uh, if you have a child, or just envision you have a child in your neighborhood, um, can I get a raise of hands for how many people would feel comfortable with, say, their eight-year-old walking or bicycling to school? Yeah, unfortunately, that's the national um, and the local trend. We used to walk and bicycle to school. And uh, now that number has just plummeted down where very, very few kids walk and bicycle to school. And all the positive benefits, now we have traffic jams in the morning. Everyone uh, knows that uh, when school is in session, how bad uh, traffic is. Um, so we're talking about um, pedestrian safety here. And we've got a situation where um, we've created unsafe conditions. And we have more people. Um, choosing not to walk, not to bicycle, and decide that driving is the best option, dropping their, their child off is the best option. And that just means there's more cars on the road and there's more danger at every crossing. Um, yeah, so um, my name's Daniel. I'm with Hawaii Bicycling League. Um, and uh, we do a lot of bicycle stuff, um, but bicycling and walking, they go, they go hand in hand in a lot of ways. Um, if we can make it safe, uh, for one mode, uh, for walking, uh, it's going to be a lot safer for bicycling. Um, a large part of it is um, those modes have a lot of the same benefits, um, the health benefits to individuals, the um, savings to that uh, individual on their household transportation costs, um, the environmental benefits, um, and yet um, we're, we're not making these decisions at, at high rates. And it's because as a society, I feel like uh, we're, we're not investing enough and we're not prioritizing enough in trying to make that shift. Um, so I think um, we know it's great that we have uh, the city represented the Complete Streets program. We are headed in the right direction, uh, but we have so much uh, further we have to go. Um, and I really, um, it takes everyone being involved in that and being willing to during that process. Um, there are trade-offs. Sometimes if you're going to make it safer, for someone walking or bicycling, you're going to make it actually harder to drive. And so um, there are big benefits. And uh, I think we need to, as a society, and a good portion of us embrace that, hey, it's worth a little bit of cost. Because as we go down the road, the benefits are so great. Thanks. Thanks, you guys. So in my attempt to sound almost as smart as these guys, I kind of uh, threw together some some statistics, some, some data to just kind of set the table. And please feel free, you guys, to kind of riff off of these, the, the stuff that I'm going to throw out there, add some context to it, um, you know, put it in perspective, challenge it. Uh, but I just thought I'd throw this out there to kind of get us thinking about what we're talking about. So for me, one of the, the money statistics is how Oahu's roads absorbed 1.6 billion more vehicle miles traveled in 2017 than they did in 1995, as well as 190,000 more vehicles registered in that same amount of time, and 190 miles of road on the island added in that time, and that's county, state, private roads. Um, Recently, the city had its uh, a community outreach meeting on um, it's, it's putting together a, its first official pedestrian plan. Uh, the big takeaway for me was a, a statistic uh, that one of the consultants laid out there. The island of Oahu currently has some 793 miles of missing sidewalk or, or areas where there should be sidewalk. Um, it would cost an estimated 1.1 six billion I think in order to somehow uh, build all of that that missing sidewalk um, last year 6200 pedestrians were killed nationwide apparently that was about the largest death toll in three decades um, recently and thank you AARP Hawaii for flagging this um, but smart growth America 
put out its 2019 Dangerous by Design report. Um, it actually has, uh, Smart Growth America has Hawaii ranked as the nation's 30th deadliest state uh, in its pedestrian danger index, which generally factors how many pedestrians in an area are killed versus how many are walking to work. So we're kind of floated, for all of the things we're talking about here, it's a nationwide pro uh, problem and we're kind of in the middle. Um, but looking at that Smart Growth America, their, kind of their readout on Hawaii, it did look like that the data only went up to 2017, which was um, actually a, a relatively good year. Uh, the number had dropped to 15 pedestrians uh, killed nationwide. Usually that number hovers. Uh, since 2003 or so, it's hovered uh, between around like 15 uh, to, I, I think last year might have even been the high mark at uh, 44 based on DOT statistics. Uh, so yeah, tw in 2018, 44 pedestrians, uh, that included 27 on Oahu. Um, so that was a spike from 2017, uh, but it did it has kind of seesawed. Um, and in recent years, Hawaii has led the nation or been up there in terms of senior pedestrian deaths. Uh, but you know, there are reasons for that. Uh, seniors are generally more active and, and we can get into you know, the, the root causes there. And so far this year, 23 pedestrians have been killed statewide through June 19th. That includes 12 on Oahu, and that compares to 21 killed at the same point last year, including 13 on Oahu. So just mid-year, um, we're kind of on pace uh, matching what we saw last year, unfortunately. So yeah, uh, that was just to kind of you know set where, where we're at locally. Um, I guess just for starters, maybe I can throw it to, to Katie. Um, and, you know, if you guys want to jump in wherever, but just maybe why you think, given those numbers and those statistics, and I don't know, you know, maybe you can put it in more perspective, but why, why you think uh, pedestrian traffic deaths aren't treated as more of like a, a pressing overall crisis, or do you think it is, it's given, uh, you know, uh, sufficient due? I'd say it's increasing, but it, a lot of times it's hidden. Um, like if you go into the top 10 things that Americans die of each year, it's hidden inside accidents. It's not an accident, it's a crash. And it's very different than an accidental poisoning, which is also in that group. If it was in its own category, it would be a top 10 killer on its own, independent. And I think that that's really critically important. I think the nature of what's happening in, well, I should, that, sorry, that was motor vehicles. So I should clarify that. But within that group, pedestrians are rising and rising pretty dramatically. And so I think there's something's happening that we aren't as aware of. And the people just aren't understanding why it's happening um, broadly within communities um, because we talk about it as if it's an accident, as if there's no way to prevent it when in reality that's not true. And so I think that a big part of it is how the discussions get framed. For every article that talks about how, um, you know, pedestrians are really important and we should protect them, there's another one that says the car crashed into a pedestrian and a pedestrian's at fault. And so first off, apparently no one's driving that car. Like the, the car has its own agency all of a sudden. And we refuse to ascribe that responsibility to the driver whatsoever. Um, and then on top of that, like, it automatically means that the pedestrian, who is not encrouched in multi-tons of metal, is somehow responsible for it as well. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, there isn't something there, but, you know, someone's driving a multi-ton vehicle that can kill, and someone's just walking. It seems slightly out of whack, and a lot of our discussions are about that, and so I think that, and that happens nationwide. We are not unique in that by any stretch of the imagination. This happens at all sorts of publications, and it's been a real shift, and I think particularly within the transportation community to have people recognize some of this because the language around it is pretty, um, it just hides it really well in a way that I just don't think people under realize it until you really start to pay attention and you're like, wow, that's crazy. That's, that's really nuts, so. Basically, the, the, the language that we're, folks like myself, and when we're writing about this, we have to be more cognizant of of how we're writing about it um, and the kind of the, the subtle ways that it plays on, on readers' minds and, and that it's done traditionally. You are not alone. I mean, this happens in lots of conversations I have with people uh, about pedestrians and pedestrian safety. Go ahead. 
Sorry, I have like opinions on like everything. I'm, trying, I'm not going to try to talk on everything. But um, I want to mention, by the way, I do like 90% of my trans uh, reading on this stuff on my own outside of class. <laughs> um, I just read this stuff regularly. But anyway, like to answer the question about why it's like not focused on, um, the fatalities are like broad and very diffuse. You know, it's like one or two here and there, and they seem very isolated. It's not like a mass shooting or a train crash or a plane falling in the sky where lots of people die and it, you know, gets attention. We got the, the most attention like a crash got actually was probably like in earlier this January when three people died. That that caught a lot of people's attention both times. Two, it goes back to like the history of like early, you know, like when cars were first invented, they were actually quite controversial. You know, they were like the leading cause of death for like areas with a population over 15,000. And there's this outroar. But um, <laughs> cars buy newspaper ads and they decided to start this propaganda campaign about blaming pedestrians and they invented the term jaywalking and now it's just like, well, when it happens, it's just like, there's almost always this talk about, I, I hear two conversations most of the time whenever we talk about this, it's either like, oh, either pedestrian is completely to blame or oh, it's equal blame. But, you know, as I kind of mentioned, if pedestrians are being always careless, why aren't they being careless with buses or trains? You know what I mean? Because they have those those modes of um, motorized, yeah, or bikes. So those modes of motorized transportation have far lower collision rates, fatality rates, and this is pretty universal anywhere, like outside of Hawaii, whatever. You know, um, as I mentioned in my opening speech. Yeah. So Anthony, you mentioned uh, that very high-profile crash in January or February, where we're blocks from where it happened. Um, we'll be there tomorrow. Yeah, three three people died. I believe it's five uh, others seriously injured, and you know, in the wake of that, there was a lot of of public outcry. There was a, a very big rally out there. Um, maybe Daniel, if you want to jump in on this, what have we seen done um, just in those in in the months since then, and even more so, kind of building on what Anthony was talking about. Why is it that these, you know, it, it's these high profile, uh, the, these very kind of shocking incidents versus kind of that steady stream of, of um, fatalities that build up? Why does it take uh, these, these larger incidents to really spur that? Yeah, we, we get normalized to things. Um, so uh, when the three people were killed in one violent act, um, William Travis Lau, Kashmiri Perconi, and Rihanna Ikeda. Um, no, a second, and they were dead. Um, you know, I, I think we, we, you know, we said as an organization, we need to do something. This can't be normal. This can't pass without, um, you know, something saying this is not the sort of community that we can live in and let this pass without us doing something. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people felt that. Um, and, you know, it did make me think, well, why don't we do this for every single person that dies? Yeah, I mean, we'd be doing it every week, unfortunately, is the, is the truth of it. Um, just, just a thought. So, uh, Melissa Lau, uh, the, the wife of William Travis Lau, um, we, we worked with her on a red light uh, safety camera legislation, trying to get um, where the, the state um, would the state legislature would allow the city and the counties to put up um, cameras at select intersections um, to enforce um, right citations via video to people that ran the lights and to make the intersection safer in the process. And uh, the bill had a hard fight. It ended it as a committee. Um, and uh, Melissa Lau was really involved in that. And uh, she, uh, you know, I hope I'm not saying too much here, but she was hurting, as you would imagine. And I just remember her, her saying in a moment of, you know, uh, I think truth, like just because they don't have a family member that died, just because they don't have a friend that died, they don't see how this is worth a trade-off, how this is worth pissing someone off that got a citation. And I think um, it's something that we, we can all take to heart that um, I think probably the majority of us um, you know, we see traffic fatalities, we let it pass, um, and it's just, a, you know, something on the news or a number we hear. Uh, but if we really take it to heart that it would shift us internally um, and what we're willing, we're willing to push for and what we're willing to spend, spend time on. Um, yeah, so one of the outcomes of, of uh, this year at the legislature was that that passed in a committee so, uh, you know, they need to come back next year to 
try to get implementation, which is the, actually the hard part. Uh, the other thing that, and I was just at um, a signing with uh, Governor Ige, uh, was there was a bill for Vision Zero. And uh, if you leave with anything tonight, uh, Vision Zero is the concept that um, traffic fatalities are not accidents. They're not accidents, that they're preventable and that we can take actions to uh, get that number to zero or at least really close to zero. But we have to say that, that it's not acceptable, that this can't just be a byproduct from our way of life, but uh, this has to be an unacceptable thing. Uh, so that, you know, it set where the state now says that the policy of the state is to have zero traffic fatalities and to work towards that. But obviously we need all the actions afterwards, the changes uh, to the roads to uh, bring down speeds, make it safer for people to cross the street and, uh, you know, walk along them, bike along them. Um, and we need the uh, enforcement to get drivers to obey the laws when they're going to make uh, decisions otherwise. Um, and the education so that everyone understands and cares and it becomes part of a way of life of uh, driving with Kakua, that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you brought up Vision Zero. I mean, I, I th it's, it's a great initiative. I just wonder, and maybe Katie, if you want to take this, like, how realistic is it for us to really, you know, it, it seems like such a great goal, but how realistic is it truly to get to zero traffic deaths? I think just like, in life, and I don't mean to even, you know, kind of throw it off on some kind of specious argument, but I just, I'm really, I'm genuinely curious if, if it is possible to get to Vision Zero, how long would it take to even steer that boat around? I don't have an exact answer for <laughs> that one, but I will say that the communities that have implemented it, have, particularly, I think Sweden was the first one, right? have seen some really significant changes in how many people do die. Um, and I think that, particularly pedestrians, and I think that's critically important is that although zero uh, on any given year may not happen, um, the reality is, is that we could do a lot better. There was just a study that came out of the Netherlands saying that if we were just as intensive with their mode shift, um, 23,000 people in this country wouldn't have died last year. So, you know, yeah, that's not zero, but that's still a lot still better. A lot um, I, and, and we do know also that the areas that are safer and that these sorts of things don't happen, they exist in this country. They're urban and they're walkable and they protect pedestrians. They're smaller, they're not everywhere. But, you know, we do know from the data, like, what it looks like to be safer for pedestrians. This is not a mystery. This is not a technical issue. This is a political and a resources issue. Um, you know, I think Renee laid out, like, what a big challenge this is, given how many miles and, and how fast we can do it. So there's a lot of things on the ground. So, you know, a vision zero, which includes things like enforcement and education, includes engineering, it's equity, and someone's got to help me with the other E's. Who, who knows the other ones? I can't remember. There's like one or two more, depending on which program you're in. Um, thank you. What was the th last one? And if I heard evaluation, I got enforcement. Okay. Encouragement? Encouragement. Is that the? All right. So. So there's a lot of things that are still left, you know, once Renee's done, if you will. So I think that we all can do that. Um, no pressure. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, but I think it's, you know, there's a lot that needs to happen. Um, you know, all of us need to be pedestrians more, more trips, more people, more visible. And that helps get us there. Sure, sure. I'm going to put in that. Uh, there, were, there has been a period where we've had, like, zero... Well, at least nearly zero, like, traffic fatalities. It's called, like, most of history. <laughs> like, before the mass production of the automobile, you know, like, occasionally people would kicked or get kicked or trampled by a horse, and I'm sure it was a horrible way to die. But, again, we didn't, like, have people dying, like, in these numbers on roads until the mass production. This is, like, the, the, automobile, the model automobile has only been mass production for a little more than a century. Right. So, um, and then the second bit is there are actually smaller cities who definitely have like zero pedestrian fatalities, but they've done it. They've they've done it by like just banning cars from the urban core. But they're like small cities, like 100, 125,000 like population European cities. Yeah. You know, nothing really big, but um, it, it's it's dual. And that, that's just pedestrian fatality. I think I think auto fatalities still happen in those cities where they didn't ban it. But yeah. Right. So, Renee, to to get you in here a little bit, maybe if you could help us um, understand like where we see most of these pedestrian crashes occur on Oahu? So it's easy for the county to say that most of them actually do occur on state facilities. <laughs> we were proud to say. 
Um, which is not surprising, right? We have uh, major state highway arterials that run through the middle of our urban communities. Um, there are main streets very often, you know, as it circle the island. I mean, those are all state highways. Um, Pali, of course, is, you know, another recent example where someone died that is a huge major, you know, could be a freeway in certain places, but it has single family houses fronting on it. And Ala Moana as well, right? Ala exactly. Moana Ala Moana, um, Kalihi Street, you know, there's a reason reason why the state just went out and put speed tables out there because that is actually a state route that connects the port to H1 but yet there is you know three schools and a uh, park and single-family houses along it um, the other place we see a lot uh, is at signalized intersections and crosswalks which to me calls into question our very fundamentals of what we think is um, a safely engineered street right I mean we have um, so we went through this huge era of highway interstate building in America, right? For many decades, we were just building, you know, hundreds and thousands of lane miles of freeways. And so the engineering community became very organized around this effort. And those standards became street standards for everywhere. Right? They weren't intended to be for urban areas, uh, but because that effort was so big and took so much federal money um, and really organized the whole kind of transportation community, that ended up setting the standards for everyone. And so that's part of the problem, right? We've got 12 foot lanes on all of our urban streets. Those were not designed, that was not intended to be for city streets, right? They were intended for freeways, but yet we sort of took those standards and just put them everywhere. Um, so you look at, you know, a signalized intersection, it's got crosswalks, it says stop, it's got all the signs and everything. In an engineer's mind, he's looking at it and saying like, why, why isn't this safe? Why are all these crashes happening at places that have crosswalks, that have all the safety features, right, that my book tells me to put in? Um, so that, you know, kind of, you know, really want to throw everything sort of on its head. That's where you see places like in Europe where they just take out all the regulations, right? They take out the striping, they take out the signs, they take out the traffic control. Um, and of course those don't work on, you know, huge volume streets. Uh, but the theory there is if you make it feel more dangerous, then people will approach it slower um, with a little more caution. We've sort of over-engineered our streets so much that people think it's safe to just, you know, gun it through an intersection when they see a yellow light um, so I you know in our mind when you go to solutions it's you know shrink the lanes um, put in roundabouts take out the traffic signals replace them I mean that that's a huge transformation that has to happen but we have to design our urban streets as urban streets and not as freeways which is what we've done for the last 80 years or so 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 to get a little perspective on this this sounds like this turning you know we're, we're kind of going into an era where we are trying to slowly turn that ship around, redesign after decades of, of what, you know, uh, just trying to push as many cars through as possible. It seems like a really heavy lift. And maybe if you can give us any, any um, numbers on, to, so the Complete Streets Ordinance uh, was created in 2012. How many Complete Streets projects has the city roughly been able to do how many are in the works, and, and what kind of dollar amounts are we talking about with this? So, um, okay, so there's, there's sort of two main levels of complete streets projects. Uh, as you know, Mayor Caldwell has had a huge push to repave our streets. It's something that really wasn't a priority for past administrations. Um, so he'd come in and done, you know, hundreds of lane miles a year. Um, fortunately, we kind of there was a good timing sort of between this repaving effort and the complete streets law. Um, so we, <laughs> I'm the first to admit, uh, city and county is not the best at keeping data, um, but we have implemented, a, oh, it's raining. <laughs> so we've implemented, um, I, don't, I don't even, I wish I could tell you, but we've implemented a lot of projects just through regular repaving efforts. Mm -hmm. And those typically are designed in-house, right? So if there's no changes to curbs, uh, there's no real major signal changes, uh, maybe you no know, like 10th Avenue in Palolo or Kamehameha, uh, the fourth road in Kalihi where he did a road diet. Um, or, I mean, you, on and on, you kind of see them more and more bike lanes kind of just popping up when the street gets repaved. We've done, we've done actually a fair amount of those, probably right. throughout the island. Um, 
that's kind of, there's, there's a limit to what you can accomplish within the existing right of way and within just, just sort of striping changes. So there's another tier of complete streets projects that basically says, you know what, anything is on the table. We can widen sidewalks, we can do actual curb extensions, not just sort of striping and little plastic delineators. Um, that we have not built any of those. The first one that has been transferred kind of from the planning stage over to design and construction is uh, New Uwanu Avenue and Liliha Street. These all go through a pretty rigorous outreach process. It takes several years to go through planning. Um, so that one will probably get built in the next, I don't know, couple years, I would say. Um, and then we've got, I don't know, I want to say maybe 15 more projects that are sort of following along the heels of that. I want everyone to realize, though, that we have, you know, meet with our peers in Portland and whatever. They've got 800 people that work in their transportation department. We have less than 100. And look at the size of our island, right? So, so we do have a limitation on how much, and planning is, a, planning is an intensive process, right? It takes a lot of outreach, a lot of meetings, getting everybody, not just outside on board, but even internally on board. So we've got a, got a queue that we're working on, and we're now starting to use like our ped plan uh, data, our bike plan is being updated, and we're trying to see where there's overlap between some of these modal needs to pick the next round of projects. Um, so we've got projects in Kalihi that are, that's about to start. We've got ongoing projects on the windward side in town. Um, and then I'm trying to probably start one up in Wahiwa. Um, so we're trying to spread the love a little bit. But there certainly are more needs than we can get to. So we're trying to prioritize uh, what are the, you know, what are the critical ones for us. Right. So And we're talking about 3,500 lane miles, give or take, right, for... for um, about a hundred, you said about a hundred people to, to staff or less than a hundred? Uh, no, we probably got about 10 people, oh, 10 people. on our Sorry. team. I mean, okay. these people, that the hundred people, they're running the whole bus system. They're running all the traffic signals on the island, including for the state highways department. Um, so really we're, you know, I'm looking at CJ here, right? We're, we're a pretty lean team. So we're, we're starting to staff up, um, but it's going to take years. I don't know if anyone has ever tried to hire someone in government. Uh, yeah. It takes a long time, um, even just to do the you know, procurement, because we rely very heavily on consultants to help us uh, you know, augment our staff. And that, of course, is a slow process, too. So it sounds like this is just going to be decades. I have job security. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so. so and, and extremely expensive too, right? So it's a, a matter well, of, of well, we're trying uh, to, resources and We're and trying funding. to do it with the Rehab of Streets project. So if we're going in, we're doing the repaving, it doesn't cost anything just to do striping changes, right? So that's the beauty of it. That's where we can really say, okay, where do we really want to change the curbs, move utilities? That's when it becomes very expensive. Um, I don't know if some of you know, we have not built a sidewalk on this island other than like a private development in probably 30 something years. And even that was done through an improvement district process where the property owner was required to pay half of the cost. And I think we haven't done that because infrastructure costs have gotten so high that no property owner can like afford that. So we've recent, only recently said, you know what? The city will actually pay to build sidewalks for the first time in a very long time. But we have how many, 800 miles missing? Yeah. Where do we start, right? So that's kind of where, where we are. So it sounds like that you know, um, the 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 sentiment is there, but it's just the the overall uh, task at hand. It's just overwhelming. Yeah, go ahead. Say something on the the cost. So mm -hmm. this idea that it costs a lot to deliver these projects. We're spending a lot on transportation. Mm -hmm. We are. If you look at you know what we're projecting out, we're going to spend over the next twenty five years, well over a billion dollars. Um, right now, there's a, a widening... Not including rail and, uh, construction. Yeah, not including rail construction. Um, and a lot of it is capacity. We're, we're trying to make it easier to drive. We're, we're trying to make it where you get a little bit faster from point A to point B in your car. Uh, right now, a project that's being considered that's you know kind of at the end of its line, the Salt Lake Boulevard widening, a mile of Salt Lake Boulevard, and maybe Renee can say the exact amount, I think about $40 million dollars. Uh, and so what's expensive, you know? I mean, imagine how much sidewalks we can get for, for $40 million. Well, you get some, because the project is building sidewalks. <laughs> wow, one more. <laughs> and it is building bike lanes. 
right. it is not improving the intersections in downtown Salt Lake, though, which is something I'm trying to work on. So, so Katie, going back to some of the numbers and the trends we're seeing and the fatalities, uh, maybe, and what, what are some of the chief causes that we're seeing? Is it, is it more SUVs, more distracted driving, that sort of thing? Yes. All of the above. All of the above. Um, yeah, like nationwide, it's attributed to uh, a huge part of the engineering of the streets that basically what we build are higher speed streets. And the more people go faster, the more fatalities you'll have when you're a pedestrian. Another part of it is, is that 20 years ago, you had a lot less SUVs. Now you have a lot more. And getting clipped by an SUV is fatal. Getting hit by a sedan at the knees, turns out you can survive that. That's a big part of it. Distracted driving broadly, yes, is probably also part of it. Um, it. The research gets a little bit fuzzier on that. Like there's a little bit more discrepancies over like what counts and what doesn't count. Um, like for instance, some studies will be like, oh, if you use the hands-free sets, you're fine. And others are really like, no, you're basically drunk. So mm. I, I, do, I actually are, am on the side that I think you actually are impairing yourself at like a drunk driving level if you mm. are using any sort of devices. Yeah. Um, but I will acknowledge that people will fight me on that. So um, I'll fight back, if, you know, but, what? but it is pretty intense. So those three things combined pretty much account for most of it because it's not increasing a ton of VMT nationwide. And it's not this like huge amount of people walking that are new. It's, you know, yeah. when you t account for population growth, it's, it's holding pretty steady. Again, that's nationwide. That may not be 100% true here. Right. Although I've heard that like the number one vehicle is the Tacoma. So it seems to probably be true. Could, could carry. What, what do you guys think about the, the 2017 um, law that, that banned texting while, while crossing the road? <laughs> okay, like, I don't want to, like, I'm, 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 I am friends with the city council member who introduced that bill, so I, I'm not going <laughs> to, yeah, I'll be, be too, but um, if you look at pedestrian page out, okay, I don't know, like, the Hawaii statistics, because I could find them, if I could find them, I would find them, um, <laughs> but, like, nationwide, distracted pedestrians is something like 10% of, like, overall pedestrian fatality rates, but only half of that involves cars, so it's closer to, like, 5%. The other 5%, if you imagine, of people, like, walking off, <laughs> falling downstairs, walking to manholes, things like that, but anyway, only 5% of distracted pedestrian on deaths, but, um, and uh, texting and driving, by the way, nationwide is supposed to be like 18% or something. But anyway, um, <laughs> but the, the, the year after that bill was introduced, pedestrian fatality rates went from like 14 to 27. Like, yeah. <laughs> like the bill was supposed to like reduce it, but, it, it, but it, there are other uncontrolled, there are, it doesn't treat for like other factors like that contribute to traffic fatality rates. You know, f uh, drunk driving in Hawaii is 42%. That's um, higher than the um, national standard, which is about 30 uh, speeding's about 30. I mean, you kind of get the idea. You're like, you're trying to focus on this like 5%, but you're not, in con you're not controlling for the other like 95% of the reasons why people get killed by cars. Do you guys think generally there is an onus, um, you know, put, putting the onus on pedestrians in pedestrian safety if there are other ordinances or, or laws that almost criminalize pedestrians in certain situations? Or not? Oh, like if they're, it's kind of similar to what Anthony's talking about with the, um, the, uh, the ban that, you know, uh, for texting. If, if, if there's too much of a focus or a thought process that is, you know, targeting the, the pedestrians as the ones that need to um, uh, be the solution, right, as opposed to the drivers. And if there are other specific ordinances in there that, that maybe point to that. I, I, don't, I don't think this is a legal thing, but I think it's, the point is, I think everyone has a responsibility to um, to keep our streets safer. I, you know, had also had a friend who um, was killed by a driver, and she was on the sidewalk, right? And I am the most paranoid pedestrian you will ever find. Like, I really look. I mean, I make sure the car is stopping, and I'm like very, very careful. And I, and I and I notice that other folks are not, are so trusting because we have built this street system that seems to tell you that it is safe. You know, like people see a crosswalk and they think it is safe. And we are now coming to realize that that is not necessarily true. And so I don't think you can legislate that. 
Um, but drivers, I mean, everyone using our transportation system just needs to pay better attention. And the onus does get put on pedestrians, I think, because they're so vulnerable, right? Um, and I don't think you criminal, criminalize them, um, but, I, but I do think education is something that has to be a solution because we cannot change the design of our streets overnight, right? Um, and educating motorists is almost more important as well. That wasn't the question. <laughs> um, but we certainly have an issue now with, um, with crosswalks. So I, you know, I remember as a kid, you go to California, you would get sort of near, near the edge of a sidewalk and cars would just stop, right? You weren't even trying to cross the street, but cars, there was a culture of cars stopping. Here, um, cars are lucky if they will stop for you in a marked crosswalk. They do not know that it is actually legal to cross at any intersection where, whether the crosswalk is marked or not. Um, so I think education all around needs to support the engineering stuff that we're doing. Um, and it's not just on the pedestrian side, it's the motorist side. And of course, the enforcement is another piece on the motorist side. Um, but it's, you know, but criminalizing pedestrians is just not. Um, not the best way to go because it's not enforced anyway, right? I mean, we all know we have that challenge. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Dana. So, yeah. so um, my organization, Hawaii Business, we do a lot of education. So, um, you know, we're, if you want a bicycle, we want to empower you to bicycle and you can do it in a way that is going to keep yourself safe, okay? So, w with that in mind, um, we get complaints all the time about people bicycling on sidewalks, yeah? It's like the most common. You go to the neighborhood board, you're gonna sure. get a complaint about someone bicycling on a sidewalk. So on King Street, yeah, before they put in the bike lane, around 70% of people were bicycling on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And they were any which way, either direction. Now, now, it's about 3%, 3 to 4%, yeah? And no amount of education my organization could have done, and frankly, no amount of enforcement uh, if the police were out there just ticketing people, they just was people would stopped bicycling. You know, went to it's all uh, design. In other words, it's design uh, and engineering. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm getting at. Is right. n not to throw it all on on Renee and and the the state DOT, but if you design the roads in a certain way, they're going to reliably get certain behavior. They're going to reliably get speeding. They're going to reliably get people not yielding to people at crosswalks. They're going to reliably get uh, bicyclists riding the wrong way on the sidewalk. Those sort of things that uh, tend to be. Uh, have some danger and to just throw it back on the person 100% uh, misses, it's, it's not just do I think it's um, a, a little unfair, but it's not actually constructive. Right. Yeah. But And Renee was talking about, uh, you know, the, the culture um, and, you know, trying to, you know, the, the way people kind of respond to pedestrians and that's kind of a big factor with this. Just, just real fast, you know, you, you talk about the King Street Lane and, and the success of getting, you um, cyclists out of off the sidewalk you know I've also heard Mayor Cald Caldwell say this is the one thing that has been more controversial than rail <laughs> so you talk about kind of the you know uh, changing people's perceptions about what these projects do there have been similar issues in in Chinatown that that seems to be the other uh, you know issue here is, is really changing the way people perceive these these kinds of uh, changes. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, so like going back to the whole culture and like perception thing, yeah, so like most trips in Honolulu, um, Hawaii, just in general are done by car, are done by, so that's also like what affects, you know, I mean, most people are driving when they see pedestrians doing these things, that, and then from there, of course, it's also drivers, sorry, that are more likely to inform public opinion. You know, they complain to the legislators, the mayor, whatever. And the second bit is, of course, when a pedestrian gets killed, it's not like they can tell their end of the story. They're probably dead or about to die. Uh, my sister didn't die instantly. <laughs> uh, she died within, uh, within less than a day, day later uh, because of brain injuries. But you kind of get the bit. But even like the, even, but, but, but I just cited a few statistics, which clearly even then, like it's still like a small fraction of like pedestrian behavior that affects, you know, the outcome of their mm -hmm. lives. And that number is actually skewed against, because if my sister could tell her end of the story, the police report would probably look very different, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's probably most police reports. Right, right. Um, I want to transition to um, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I've already got a, a good bunch here, but if you guys want to keep writing, uh, keep, it, keep it coming for sure. So uh, here's, here's an interesting one for, off the bat. As we listen to voices around the island, I'm struck by historical inequity, i.e. Waianae has always had less sidewalks and quality of roadways is less than. In prioritizing, 
does the city's criteria, and again, we talk about, you know, where do we even start with this? Does the city's criteria account for historic inequity? It has not um, before I came into this position, but for me, it's really important. I am um, unfortunate, well, I don't know what, I'll just say this. Uh, Farrington Highway in YNI, I think is the elephant in the room and it is a state facility. Definitely. If that was a county road, that would be the first thing on my list that I would be trying to tackle because that road is uncomfortable for anyone, whether you're walking, driving, riding the bus, hanging out at the beach, that road is awful. Um, I, ha I do believe that they are doing a planning study. Uh, currently, I believe SSFM actually has the contract to do um, some safety improvements on that road. Thank goodness. Um, so I am open. I am looking for a project out there. I don't think the county facilities are quite as bad, um, but I certainly have my lens towards something to do in YNI. Um, Wahiwa has sort of risen um, to the top in a number of conversations, and they're very active community there, wanting the improvements, which is important for us, right? We have a whole island that we have to look at. If we have willing partners there to help us with outreach, um, we're naturally going to be sort of drawn there. Um, I have been working in Kalihi for the last 10 years. I was doing planning around the rail stations um, as well as Waipahu. So those two are always on my radar as well. Um, but, you know, it, I welcome anybody who has um, projects, who has needs to kind of come to the county. I sort of have my, my three things. I have the, you know, push us, stand by us, and be patient. Um, but really, like, we want to know where the needs are um, and where those partners are in these communities. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these communities don't have very uh, organized um, you know, advocacy efforts sometimes, or the few people who are in these communities are kind of overstressed because they're like on every single committee. Um, but that's certainly important to me, and I think if you see the next round of projects we're going to do, they're going to be um, in some of these areas outside of the urban core. And maybe just to stay with you, Renee, this is kind of an interesting one. What about a, a ghost bike program for pedestrian deaths? And I think by that, if I'm, if I'm interpreting that correctly in other cities, um, oh, or Daniel, yeah, sure, sorry. We also have our HBL guy here. Um, you know, the, these uh, in other cities, I, I was just in New York, and you would see, it's eerie, you'll see these uh, uh, white bicycles, uh, which indicate that a fatality occurred at that particular spot. Anything in the works uh, for a similar program here? I, yeah, I think uh, memorials are, you know, uh, memorials are definitely, um, you know, they can be a form of community grieving for sure. And, um, and they can also maybe helpfully shift people a little bit in their mindsets. Um, yeah, so we, we don't have any, so, I'll tell you one thing that we do, uh, we don't specifically do uh, memorials, uh, you know, uh, um, either are the ghost bikes or, um, uh, you know, some other form of that. Um, one thing that we do is we have uh, what are called solutions meetings. Uh, we don't do this where every fatality occurs. We've done uh, maybe 15 of them now where a bicyclist or pedestrian is killed or seriously injured, um, bringing together um, the Department of Transportation Services, um, the police, elected officials from the area, community members, community groups, um, anyone that has some, some stake in moving about in that community and wants it to be safer, um, to have a conversation about uh, what we can do to make it safer, to say something really, really, the, the worst possible thing occurred here, and we, sh we should say, hey, let's make sure that doesn't happen again. Uh, what solutions can we come up with that we can act on? Uh, changes of the road engineering, uh, education, more education that we can do, um, enforcement. Um, and I think it's been a good thing because, um, you know, it sensitizes people in a lot of sense. I'm sure that, you know, like an elected official is probably aware of things that are happening, but to sit out there and to go to the site and to look and to hear through things in as much detail as we can and then rack your brain for a while to think about what really could be done to make it safer um, and then try to pursue some of those things I think is really uh, a good thing. Okay. This is a good one too. Um, and this might do well for Katie or also Renee or anybody jump at it. So what role might e-scooters have in Hawaii's transportation landscape and what ways could we overcome the barriers? Now, again, this question comes in the context that Lyme 
basically, you know, the way these companies typically have gone, they'll ask for forgiveness rather than permission. They flooded the streets for all of about three days. Uh, they were swiftly removed. Um, but since then, there's been, there was, as far as I know, a kind of a, a brief push for a, like a multimodal, um, and Katie, you might have, you guys were both probably involved in this, where you're looking at, at new innovative uh, mobility uh, ways and how they might fit in the city. So I'd say both the east, if, if you guys want to look at if, whether we can get e-scooters, whether they can be part of the, the solutions here, and where we're at on the, the, the broader issue of, of kind of these alternatives to cars, right? I want to go first. Well, I think one of the challenges, is my understanding, is that they're not legal and that the code actually has to be changed at the state level. So that's a very clear legislative fix that would need to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they are part of the solution. Urban communities haven't necessarily figured out like how they want them to be a part of it all the time, and there's a lot of different ways people are experimenting with this. Um, you know, the model you said asked for, you know, asked for, for forgiveness afterwards, but, you know, some are having pilot programs. Um, there's a big data sharing organization and structure that's happening, um, forcing them to share their data so that we can understand what's happening. So I think like it would be really nice because we have some hills. Uh, like I kind of tell you, like those would be nice, I think, for a lot of people. And particularly for people who like bikes may not be as easy an option for them due to health issues. So um, I think we have to keep all options kind of open if we really want to switch modes. Um, but I think you also have to, you know, figure out the right kind of structure. And I, I do, well, I think that also like the city is planning on sort of tackling that is my understanding through a plan to understand like how can we go about that. And we are not the only ones struggling through that particular process. But I think, you know, from an environmental standpoint, it's important. And I think providing more options for people on the system we have, given that engineering is going to take 30, 40 years, that we, I think we have to be open to them um, and figure out, like, how can we all share this space effectively? Because that's what a lot of it is. Right now, we all are sharing 5% of the roadway <laughs> that aren't cars. And so we need to change that conversation and that ratio pretty dramatically. Um, you know, from a transportation perspective to get to the multimodal, but also from a climate perspective and an energy perspective, we have to do it a lot faster than that. So we need to talk about, like, why is it that this one mode that has a lot of these problems gets so much space and, you know, kills people in the process at a disproportionate rate and hurts our vulnerable and, and hurts people who aren't even driving. So, I mean, you know, there's a lot there that I think, you know, that we need to be open to those things. So that's... Uh, but I think Marie will probably have some other suggestions and statements about where they're headed. The, the, more, the more I read about e-scooters, the, the more I'm just grateful that they're not here. <laughs> um, it's a totally, it's, a, it's just a very gray area. You know, like I totally hear Katie, it would really help in some of our mobility challenges in Honolulu. It would probably not help our pedestrian safety problem, right? <laughs> It, it's it's so yeah it's a challenge um, you know if you know it would be great if they could just like go away and come back in 10 years and we've got this amazing bike lane <laughs> bike network built out uh, of course that's not gonna happen of course and I want them to come because they're fun um, but I do think especially with our seniors um, I, I'm really concerned about this issue. So as Katie alluded to, you know, we were pushing the state this year to pass a law um, to make them legal. It did not happen, but we're pushing that um, again next year. We're also going to be rolling out a shared mobility bill um, before too long um, to look at, you know, uh, other, you know, that could include e-scooters as well as sort of other models that could come down the pike and ways to permit them, which is one of the problems that happened with Lime. They sort of didn't approach us and get any approvals. They just like dropped it on the street. Um, so we're trying to get ready for some of this stuff, but I'd be lying if I said I had a, a you know, overnight solution for how to make them safely integrated into Honolulu. And as Katie said, this is like a national challenge that all cities are trying to wrestle with. Um, we just have very narrow sidewalks here. Um, so I really do worry uh, about what to do with them until such time as we have great bicycle facilities for them to ride in. Okay. Uh, just a quick comment that somebody made in um, regards to the previous discussion. Pedestrians and cyclists are targeted to be at fault because they are more visible when they misbehave. Um, this is a good one to add to throw into the conversation. Are autonomous vehicles a possibility in Hawaii in the near-term future? If so, 
does that bring you concern or hope? And I'm in regards to pedestrian safety as well, too, right? Overall safety. Uh, I repeat my answer from the e-scooters. It's gray area there. Um, I know the state uh, is setting up a task force to look at the legal issues around autonomous vehicles and has invited the department um, to serve on that. Um, sounds like it's sort of just a legal thing at this point, not necessarily, you know, how do we design our streets and uh, manage our curb space and price um, our, our, you know, use of our streets to manage all of these uh, different sorts of uses. I don't think we're at the cutting edge of AV uh, technology, um, but of course, you know, the uh, incident in Phoenix, I think, uh, mm -hmm. really opened everybody's eyes about the challenges. Um, with pedestrians and then of course there's ethical issues in there right like do you choose I mean you have to program these things right so do you tell the car to run into a school bus or to hit the pedestrian on the sidewalk right like you have to program some of these ethical decisions um, that we just make on a you know sort of split second um, in a moment when when something is going wrong so there's I mean this is a whole nother realm um, of pedestrian safety challenges that that I don't think they're going to help pedestrian safety because pedestrians don't have the technology to communicate with the cars like the cars have to communicate with each other. Um, so I actually think this is another yeah. area that we're going to be severely challenged in. Sure. So uh, I think everything Renee laid out is, is true. Um, but I don't think we have the luxury of necessarily sitting back and letting it happen to us. Um, right now in the United States, there are 76 different autonomous vehicle tests happening right now on our streets. Some of them are closed roads, but some of them aren't. So I think it's coming. I think the question we have as like a larger community is like, what do we want them to look like? Do we want them to be zero occupancy vehicles or do we want them to you know, potentially be paying attention to pedestrian safety? being shared, being electric, and you know, potentially providing transportation services to people who are historically difficult to reach under a whole host of reasons. Um, so I think we have to be really careful about that. And I think we also have to articulate like the vision we would like. Like if these things do come, how do we make them work for us? How do they meet our community goals? And I think that's actually a really critical piece of the discussion that sometimes gets like bogged down in like the major technology, like woo, you know, I mean, there are some good things to it. Um, because as we sort of talked about, a lot of the causes for issues are driver error. Uh, you know, I mean, it's impaired, it's speeding, it's, it's drunken, it's, it's a whole host of these things. Some of those get mitigated if it's an autonomous vehicle, presumably. That's, that's the promise of it. But, um, but I think we have to like say that like we, we're willing to be interested in these things, but under these terms, and this is what we want them to achieve for us as a community, um, I think that's a really important piece, so. Uh, maybe for, for Daniel, this might be a good one. And it's really kind of pressing the issue that we brought up about complete streets, overhauling road design. What can be done to accelerate the pace of street redesign? Among state and county leadership, how much support is there really for this? And so maybe in your role you know, in advocacy, how much support do you realistically see in your you know, your uh, meetings and such with, with public officials? So I, I think there's different um, departments or institutions that have all sorts of employees. I think the, the model of DTS, the, the City Department of Transportation Service, um, once they, we adopted the complete streets law of them going through training, of having some uh, initial projects they were working on, I really think it's been good at getting the department there. Uh, unfortunately, the state DOT did not have a similar process, and I think a lot of their, at a staff level, they're not all the way there yet in being embracing kind of new ways of designing the roads, because, I mean, it's been said by many engineers, but uh, an engineer is going to solve a problem, but they need to know what the problem is and what tools they have to solve that problem. And so for some of the older engineers, the problem they were solving was traffic flow always. And so it's changing what that problem is and then giving them some new tools to get there. Uh, but I will say that it's, uh, it's political. I mean, uh, we talk about money a lot, that money, money is a thing. Money, money is a thing, but um, it's about having the will, the political will to accept trade-offs. That's the biggest 
I think, challenge. And, uh, you know, frankly, in, in my experiences, a lot of times um, the departments will look to the state uh, legislator or they'll look to the council member and if the council member is really against it or really supportive a lot of times that's a decision maker they'll look to the community what they're hearing to the community is the community say no 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 um, then they're they're gonna they're gonna change it and it's just kind of they're still living in a political reality so in terms of actually really pushing it I think the grassroots uh, mobilizing uh, getting uh, coalitions together um, getting people out to meetings, um, they're able to make those cases within their communities, that that's really what's going to propel uh, stuff forward. I mean, uh, you know, we talk about um, where things happen and that, uh, you know, sometimes there's inequities in the way projects occur, but sometimes you go to a community and you just can't get enough su ground well support from that community that it ends up uh, being shut, shut down, you know. I, I was in uh, Waimanalo and the state's uh, project out there. This is going back more than a year. And um, unfortunately, uh, the community has this really strong bias against bike lanes. So it's partly there's a lot of uh, recreational cyclists that bike through there. They don't have the most positive feeling towards them. But every time I go to Waianae, or so Waimanalo, there are tons of people that look like they definitely are going short distances, live in that community, and are bicycling. I, every time, I, I, now I'm super alert to it. Um, and yet the community was just so adamant they did not want these bike lanes. And so the DOT had the right thought, uh, and they had the right concepts. But uh, in the face of that uh, community um, sentiment, it, you can't push anything through. You know, that's Right, right, sure. Sorry, yeah, I? yeah, go ahead. So I just want to tell one story, and then, yeah, I'll be fast, I promise, <laughs> is that I would also encourage people to talk to their neighborhood board <laughs> representatives because I can tell you having visited approximately 10 neighborhood boards in the 10 months I've been here or so that I pretty much every single one com discusses traffic safety and pedestrian safety and all these types of things and simultaneously doesn't understand why sl slowing traffic down is important for pedestrians. So it'll happen within like the same meeting is that someone will say, oh, that complete streets project, uh, whatever, and then complain about speeders. So there's a lot of people out there who don't quite understand the connection. So, you know, everything Daniel said is 100% true, but even if you just talk to people about this issue in your own communities and your own discussions, I mean, when I tell people I walk places, they look at me like I'm crazy. So, I mean, I think like even that like day-to-day -day interaction, I ask people that I came by walking um, every morning, like, what, what should I talk about at this forum? What do you want me to say? And they're like, they started basically, they're pedestrians and they started victim blaming. And so I'm, so like, these are people who are out there every morning. I see them all the time. So, you know, have those conversations, helping change the conversation about it on top of everything Daniel said. Great. <laughs> That actually answers another. It has been changing. I'm going to mention actually a few. Like Hawaii Bison League is, uh, is up here, but Blue Zones Hawaii, they've been good in advocacy, AARP, um, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. I, I've kind of met a lot of these people through like the course of like the last few years. And, you know, speaking of an organization you're interested in. But, um, and uh, this past legislative session, actually, Hawaii Bicycling League was actually fairly impressive. They like, succeeded from, <laughs> the, the, there was a bill that was going to ban bicycling on the Capitol, and they flipped right. it. Like, they didn't get their bicycle lane, but at least they stopped bicycling from being banned from the Capitol. I wish they got their bicycle lane, you know? But, um, and the other thing is that, that's missing from the component from discussion is, I, I mentioned buses quite a bit, but yeah, buses, public transportation by far is still the safest form of like motorized transportation. And there, is, there isn't really like a group that focuses on expanding, you know, public transit, better routes. I mean, like there's at least like 100,000 bus users on this island. I actually like, like look at this stuff too, right? Like, um, and there's about 100,000 people on this island that use like buses on a daily basis. If I could get like half of them to like form organization, That'd be bigger than like, any union here, and that would also infinitely, if we just got more people to use the bus, if it was just more convenient, you don't always need density, but just better service, um, it would get more people to use the bus and thus make streets safer. But it is definitely more organization. And okay, but when we create more congestion for cars, we're also creating more congestion for buses. So I just want to help you understand the conundrum that we're often in, right? This is, this is a challenge. This is a real challenge. We say we design our streets for buses. We end up designing our streets for fast traffic. Okay? They want wide lanes. They don't want speed tables. They want these big turning radii. Like this is a real challenge that we deal with on a daily basis. Okay? So it's, it's 
just okay. so you appreciate the, right. the, the conundrum there. The yeah, I wasn't talking about like the roads and the highways about that bit. Just simply expanding, making service more convenient, making buses more convi uh, go more places, running quicker, more on time. And that sort of thing, um, and maybe getting rid of a car lane or two for like bus rapid transit. That was an idea that was explored for a little bit, but it got killed. Um, so, so I'm just going to transition real fast. Um, these these two questions really seem to kind of go together to me. Um, how does rem and this this touches on what you were talking about in the very beginning, Renee? How does removing a marked crosswalk make it safer? And then in parentheses, since it's still legal to cross. And then another um, uh, card, Renee mentioned internal controversy about removing and adding sidewalks. Can she elaborate? What are the main <laughs> items of contention? <laughs> I'd like to strike that from the record. <laughs> too late, too late. OK, so we have, over many, many decades, created very large, wide, multi-lane streets in our city. We have a lot of unsignalized crosswalks that span multi-lanes. Um, I personally almost got run over by a police car of all people. I used to cross at YLI Avenue and 4th, uh, YLI and 4th every day. Um, numerous times I almost got hit there. So I, um, I see the gray. I talk a lot about gray issues. This is a very, very gray issue. Um, removing the crosswalk some people think uh, makes, would make pedestrians more alert in crossing. You know, some people think when you're jaywalking, you're actually slightly safer because you're paying a lot more attention. Um, there is a study that sort of proves that, you know, when there is a marked crosswalk, there is less pedestrian alertness. Um, there are also other studies that show when you mark a crosswalk that, you know, drivers do pay a little bit of attention sometimes. So it's sort of, uh, there's no right answer here. The point is, when we put in a marked crosswalk, we are legally, there's a legal expectation that we think that that is a safe place for people to cross. And we are now coming to the realization that these are not safe crosswalks. Anyone who's driven down King Street and seen a five lane one way, we know this is not a safe place to cross. Um, is it a convenient place to cross? Yes. You know, like, do you want to walk all the way down to the signal and walk half a mile out of your way? No. So this is, this is the, the challenge that we're in. And so where we've gotten to the point um, where the only real solution that we have on the books is to do some kind of signal there, right? Either uh, an overhead uh, like pedestrian uh, hybrid beacon or a rapid flashing beacon on the side or literally a traffic signal um, is the only way that we can safely get people across our, our very large streets. This is a terrible place to be in because it takes us about five years to put in a signal. Uh, we have all kinds of issues. We have archaeological issues come into play because we're trying to put footings. We get into EV. Uh, if we go, you know, 18 inches below the ground, we have now this, you know, the standard for traffic signals you guys may have seen is humongous uh, to handle these sort of hurricane force winds. Signals, to me, is not the solution. Um, so I, this is what I was saying. I kind of approached Katie earlier. I would like to do a pilot in Honolulu. Uh, take some of these multi-lane crosswalks and see if there's a better way to get people safely across the street. I applaud the state for putting uh, these sort of in-lane um, delineators on the poly highway crosswalks. I think anyone who drives that know it gets you to sort of like slow down a little bit, pay attention. Uh, we also have the issue of multi-lane, multi-threat, right? So if you're behind someone, they're going too slow, you kind of go around them to get you know, where you're going without realizing that they're actually slowing down because there's a crosswalk there, there's a pedestrian in the crosswalk. So can we do, you know, rumble strips or delineators to keep people from going around? There's, there's got to be some solution other than just an overhead uh, traffic signal that costs a lot of money, 
doesn't even work when the power goes out, whatever. It's, and, and honestly, it's probably too ugly for a lot of our beautiful communities. Like this is Hawaii, they're not context sensitive. Um, so this is something that I wanna, I wanna push, I wanna pilot and see if we can figure out a way um, to keep some of these crosswalks because we're pretty limited. We can do a signal, we can put the road on a road diet and get it down, say from four lanes to three lanes. We did this on Date Street. Uh, but there's some places where, you know, we just, um, where the traffic volumes are just so heavy that we know there's going to be community uprising uh, if we, you know, create too much traffic. So it's, this is a complicated issue. It's one where we're wrestling with uh, right now. But as we go through and re repave all the streets on the island, we are looking at every single crosswalk through this lens. So there are crosswalks that are coming out. Um, and is it, you know, I, there's no right answer. Um, this is where I have to kind of, you know, ask you to sort of empathize with us and kind of understand what we're going through. Um, but we do realize that it's a, it's a challenge. Um, probably have time for just a couple more questions. Um, somebody brings up, how about uh, the concept of, quote, protected mobility lanes instead of just bike lanes uh, for anyone who isn't walking or on a high-powered motor, motor vehicle? So for bikes, e-bikes, scooter, uh, scooters, et cetera. And it seems like the, the King Street lane, right? You'll see, uh, you know, uh, scooters and, and the like, small motorized things in there. But uh, I don't know, um, the, the idea of, of something with a, a broader definition for, for other, other transportation devices, mobility devices. Uh, well, so, um E-bikes, uh, a bill just passed. So e-bikes had been kind of in regulatory limbo, um, and I, I, I wasn't on the governor's veto list, so it's going to become law um, that basically treats e-bikes up to a certain, the federal definition, um, as, as bicycles. So e-bikes would be allowed in, in bike lanes and, and bike paths and et cetera. Um, okay. And, you know, we've, we've had some conversations with the e-scooter companies um, that, you know, want um, to uh, bring e-scooters here and, uh, you know, do it in a positive way. And I guess generally um, the consensus, the practice is that bike lanes are the best place they belong. And in a way, it, it makes sense to me. You know, you're looking at speed compatibility um, and, uh, and, and, you know, anything that's moving in that, you know, 8 to to 15 mile an hour range is going to go relatively well in there as long as it's moving in the same direction and has a relatively low weight. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I could see that being a, a more formal direction. I mean, right now, um, as Katie said, e-scooters, e I think, are basically their um, unregisterable mopeds, so they're, they're illegal vehicles. Um, but I, I think that that's probably a conversation we're going to have in the next year to, to two years is where they belong. and. Uh, they probably do not belong on, on the sidewalk if they're moving 15 miles an hour. They definitely do not belong on the sidewalk. Um, but, you know, figuring out um, wh where they belong, um, probably in bike lanes, but I feel like that's a community conversation that we haven't really had yet. But I, I think, uh, you know, that's, that's going to happen. Okay. And then just to round things out, and thanks everybody again for being such a great audience and, and being so attentive. Really appreciate it. Um, Somebody asked uh, for kind of a general comment from you guys on this letter to the editor in the Star Advertiser uh, regarding uh, the HB, HBD seeking $10 million uh, transfer to fund overtime. Uh, Kevin and Susan Mulkern from Kulio'o write in, $10 million would fund a lot of red light cameras and van cams, reducing the need for additional officers and generating revenues. What's wrong with automation? Uh, this is how the private sector is dealing with its labor shortage. Thoughts? So, so we pushed hard for a red light safety uh, camera legislation as this uh, last session. It's committee, so it, it needs to go through another step before it becomes legal. But automated enforcement, um, you know, the police cannot be everywhere. And, um, you know, if you have a form of automated enforcement, you can think about where you want to put it. You can put it in places where it's going to have a safety impact um, and you can s systematically enforce it. So, you know, not because someone has the right sticker on their car, they get a pass or, you know, whatever reason, uh, it'll be systematically enforced. So there's a lot of reasons to, 
to love automated enforcement. Um, and I think the, the biggest is that it becomes a, an engineering tool. So it's where engineering meets enforcement because you can really intelligently select where to put them and you can make that case to the community. This is not a revenue generating thing. This is the, the reason we have traffic laws is to keep people safe. And the reason we selected to put this device out there in that particular place is to make the road safer because we know there are issues. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm excited for it. I've um, lived in a few places that have tried it, and it became sort of a political football. <laughs> like yeah. they were legal, and then they took them out, and then they put them. So right. I hope we are just more committed to it in a more logical manner. Um, you know, when you talk to police, they they understand the problem that is happening. Um, but of course, they're limited in their own enforcement, right? I mean, to go chase down a car in an urban street that's speeding, I mean, creates its own pedestrian safety problem, right? So I think it's a perfect solution for some of our urban areas. Um, that's why they go to get jaywalkers, I'm guessing, right? They're just easier to catch because they're on foot, right? right. Um, which, is, which is a whole nother topic that uh you know gets me going and the crash um, over here started with the pursuit as exactly well. yeah. and so you know you talk about safety i mean i think it actually is you know safety measure in more than one way also yeah. you know helping the police officers not become you know a detriment to public safety okay no oh, they, yeah, they don't say on that too it doesn't just like help with the intersections um you know, they, they put the cameras out, but it actually kind of has like a halo effect. You know what I mean? We always think of like streets and intersections as, you know, these isolated places, but in the end, like as Renee can talk about it, it's, it's a network, you know? Um, but just get, just getting people, just get the idea of just not running red lights on a regular basis, just in the practice of it, it's probably just probably going to be a good thing on the long term. Great. And then one more thing is that um, it could become a revenue source. So I know we say money is not the problem, but money could become a problem. Um, so our mayor has committed a lot of funding to do this, you know, paving, rehabilitation of streets program. That was not the case before Mayor Caldwell, right? So we're relying on that funding right now to implement complete streets. That's not really a long-term solution. We do need dedicated funding to be able to build these projects, to build sidewalks, to fix intersections. Um, so if that, you know, solves multiple goals with one tool, uh, e even better. Well, that's about all our time. Um, thank you, panel. You guys were great. Uh, it's very informative.